Hey there, Roberto here. My guest for this episode is John Faisendier. He is an emotional intelligence expert. He and his company specialize in helping teams, managers, and frontline staff better deal with customers, both internal and external. We talk about how it all works and why it's so important in the workplace. Let's do this. As you recently heard me announce, if you follow this podcast, it is currently under rebrand mode under construction mode, if you will. So I'm still working on the idea of business and creativity and the intersection thereof. So just hang tight. We'll uh, get an identity again, I promise. It'll come very soon. So in the meantime, let's talk a little bit about my guest for this episode and uh, the interview that follows. John Faisandier's company is called TUF, or T-U-F, which stands for Thrive Under Fire. We talk about how psychodrama and neuroscience play into dealing with stress, upset customers, business relationships, and more. He's been specializing in emotions and emotional intelligence since 1998. I'm guessing he's got it dialed in, so to speak. His website has a number of free resources as well as paid courses for businesses. I encourage you to check it out at tough.co.nz for New Zealand, and that's tuf.co.nz. Here is me and John Faisandier. John, thank you for joining me this afternoon or this morning for you. You are speaking to me from Wellington, New Zealand, where you told me just a moment ago it's 8.15 in the morning, and it is 2.48 in the afternoon in Panama for me, but good morning. <laughs> good day. How are you? Nice to be here. Thank you. Tell me a little bit, uh, me and the listeners, about your book, Thriving Under Fire, please. Well, my, my book, um, really, it, it's the product of, of a life's work. Really, and um, I, I didn't consider myself to be a writer until I realized this book just needed to come out. And it's come out of workshops that I run, teaching people to manage emotions in the workplace. And that's really what I do and I've been doing for the last 20 years my book it's a story book so I wrote it uh, you know I, I really believe that uh, stories are the best way to teach so it's a story of a, about a woman running a cafe and uh, all the customers come in and provide these difficult moments for her and I just happen to be there when these things happen and able to give her some coaching so it's a um, yeah it's a book really and it, and it covers all of the things that I cover in my workshop and uh, many real examples that came from life, people that I've heard, all sorts of funny things and weird things that happened. Nice. It reminds me of a book, and maybe before we're done, I'll remember the title, a very well-known business book. And the author refers to a handful of stories, but there's one in particular, and it may be because it's the first one introduced in the book about a woman who was in the business of making pies, but he has others, as I recall. I remember um, a story about a hotel, but I like that. I like that you did it that way. Ah, uh, that's uh, Michael Gerber. Thank you. The E Myth. What's the name of the book again? The E Myth. The E Myth. That's the E for entrepreneur. Yep, that's right. Thank you, boy. I was hoping my description was good enough that you might remember. Was it by chance? Any inspiration at all for you using a story approach? Well, it was really because I read that book um, when I first got into business. And uh, it was very helpful. I, I, I thought Michael Gerber was, uh, was great. Uh, it certainly gave me a lot of ideas about running a business, how to run it as uh, that you could replicate it into franchise, even though I've not done that. But uh, having good processes in your business was, was really part of that. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, my reading list is growing and growing, you know, all these things I want to get to. Um, and there are a few things I want to go back and reread. And I believe I've I've hit the e-myth twice, but it's been quite a while. In your memory, I don't know when the last time you read it was, but based on all the things that you've learned, because you've been doing what you do for quite some time, is there anything, you know, new that's perhaps not captured in there? I know he's very focused on on processes, but as much as you can speak to that aspect, is there anything pretty new that you've kind of learned along the way that that's not maybe wasn't covered at the time and maybe maybe he's actually done a very very recent edition i don't even know i need to go back and check but yeah anything new yes well he he has done the with the emeth revisited for me I, I suppose that i there's hard work in it there's still hard work you've got to keep doing the work and he he was really saying how if you don't have good systems you've got to work even harder 
you know, and things get chaotic and out of hand, and then the business owns you rather than you owning the business was one of his key ideas. And I suppose for me, uh, running my own business is um, making sure I get good uh, assistance, ad- ad- particularly administrative assistance with people from people that do these tasks better than I do and doing the things that I don't like doing. You know, it's funny. I am actually in the process of bringing a couple of people in to help into my world to help me out with uh, podcast production and some of the things related to it because I run a couple of them. And um, my wife has been in, has worked for a number of startups and and uh, some some larger corporations in the medical devices world where she, where she helps them implement quality systems so they can typically so they can meet FDA food and drug administration requirements. But I asked her; she's a great soundboard for me, and we we work at home. But um, I was telling her that you know I feel like I I want you know one of the folks that I'm working with to capture a little more detail. And I had some thoughts in my head, but anyway, I asked her for some advice and she was like, I think a diagram or, a, you know, a checklist, which we talked about. And, and that, those are, were exactly the things I was thinking of, but it was definitely speaking to the processes and has me about thinking about the next person that's coming on <laughs> to help me already that, yeah, I need to get some good processes in place. Cause otherwise you, you know, um, like you said, you end up the business owning you. <laughs> oh, well, the other thing about that, was actually taking time to sit and think, which is what partly what you're doing, draw, drawing the diagrams. But, um, and I just realized that I've been very busy lately and haven't sat down and really been thinking about my business. And we have quite a, a successful property developer in New Zealand. And I remember he wrote a book and said, you know, you need to spend at least an hour a week sitting down, really thinking about your business and even longer, supposedly not doing anything but really thinking through what, what your business is and what you're doing. Out of curiosity, what does that um, routine look like for you? I know you said you haven't done it lately, and I don't know exactly what that means in terms of time, but when you do sit down to think about your business, what does that process literally look like? If I had a, if I had a webcam and was, <laughs> was watching you sit down somewhere to think, what, what is it that you do? Well, I, d- I do a lot with mind mapping. Because the mind and the thinking process is isn't uh, lateral, you know, or, or sequ- necessarily uh, or sequen- or sequential because it comes one after the other. But the things, you know, so mind mapping certainly helps that. And every so often, I sit down and really mind map out what's happening, what's going on in my business, what are the things, what's the context, and so that's a, certainly a good way of capturing that, you know. The diagram part can come later when when you systematize it, but your mind works much more freely than you know in a in an order. It doesn't certainly doesn't work in an orderly fashion. Do you like to do this on paper, on post its, or do you have a piece of software you typically like to use? Oh no, I, do, I absolutely do it on paper, and I work with pencil. When I wrote my book, I wrote with pencil. I'd, I'd read this somewhere that uh, in a pencil. It's quite different from even w- working with a ballpoint pen. And um, so I have a big stack of pencils, and I, and I love working with pencil. Um, somehow mm-hmm. there's something different about the way it goes on the paper. That's cool. I hear, you know, check, you're going to get a kick out of this, but I heard an interview with a best selling author. Boy, my memory's not working today late in the day because it's maybe maybe you'll remember this one too by the description, but I'll have to remember one of his books, of course. But he, you know what I think he wrote is the Graveyard Book. I think it's the same author who wrote that book, but he loves fountain pens, not, you know, the, the type with the regular cap, but the ones that you literally put into a, an inkwell, you know, every time you're going to write. And he he said that he actually writes with those, like he writes his novels with those and and there was for him there was something about the the i guess the permanence but there was also there was also some sort of love for the whole i guess tactile and artsy experience of that but it's very interesting what you said about doing it doing it with pencil i thought about what he had said i'm like that's so fascinating i don't know if i'm ever going to try that because i can't see myself doing it but now i thought maybe someday because it just sounds kind of fun to hold one of those but now you got me thinking about picking up a pencil again and and doing that I love the whole mind mapping concept. And the funny thing is I've used it for writing 
and starting, you know, new books. And I've also used it for reimagining something, but I haven't really tried it in, in this sense of processes or looking at the things that are going on right now or problem uh, solving so much. So I'll have to give that a try with this, um, uh, thinking about my, my diagram, as you were saying, maybe a little mind mapping, uh, would come before. I want to shift gears already, but, um, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, you know, I think a lot of people are familiar with the, with emotional intelligence. Something that I've read about you and that I guess is self-descriptive, but I wasn't, I, I'm not sure I had seen, I probably had heard the term, but, or at least one of the words in the term, but I don't see it a lot. And perhaps it's true for others, but psychodrama therapy or psychodrama therapist. Can you talk about that? And maybe both of those things, both that and emotional intelligence, if you have warranted it. Yeah, sure. Um, very happy to. I mean, the, most people have heard the, the term psychodrama in relation to Hollywood movies as a description of some terrible, horrible horror movie. Right. But um, actually, it was a term uh, invent, uh, coined in in the 1920s or even the 1910s by Jacob Marino, who was a psychiatrist from Vienna, worked um, a post-war World War One in refugee camps in Europe, then um, moved to the States. He developed this method, the psyche is the mind, basically, drama is to act out. So rather than having people just talk, and this was the time, incidentally, he, he also was familiar with Sigmund Freud, who had people on the couch talking about their problems. And he allegedly went up to Freud after one of his lectures and said, Dr. Freud, where you have people lying on the couch thinking and talking about their past, I have people standing up and acting out their future. So it's got a very long history. And uh, um, even role play, which we're all familiar with, uh, developed by Kurt Lewin in the 1940s, he, he was inspired by Jacob Marino. Now, it, it can be used therapeutically, which is what I, I did work for about five years in a hospital for drug and alcohol rehabilitation and um, that there uh, the patients had the opportunity to redo moments from their past particularly things that triggered their drinking and drugging and they could reenact the past up to a point where they became difficult and then they have the choice to make new decisions things that they couldn't decide when they were four years old or seven or 10 or something, you know, because they were, they were only little, a lot of these things were abuse, you know, terrible sort of abuse things. They could then get into that space and challenge their abuser and um, not just verbally, but do this in a physical way. So uh, it became quite cathartic for the uh, protagonist or the patient who was doing this, it's, it's done in the group, so you get group members to play different parts, and they, um, the patient would roll reverse, so they could roll reverse with their mother and their father and whoever else was in their life, and um, they get a different perspective on their life, what happened. As well as seeing that, then they can also redo that and say, actually, that's not how I want it. This is what's needed. And um, often, um, of course, it, you know, there needs to be resistance because they've lived with that previous, you know, their, their original trauma uh, all their lives and it's part of them. So they, they kind of have to really, it becomes quite a physical thing to make those changes. So that's the therapeutic end of psychodrama, yeah. I presume that there's application for this in the business world or application for much of your work in the business world. So I guess I wanted to ask, is, is there sort of direct application for this type of therapy or, or approach, I should say, philosophies, whatever the best word is, within, like when you're doing training or education for business community, in for business communities? There is, and really this method inspires my work now. It took me 10 years to be qualified as a psychodramatist, and then I worked, and then I t did another 10 years and became a trainer. So this is really my the basis of my work and how it works. Um, what, well, it's a systemic way of thinking psychodrama. So when you set out on the stage, all the you know different uh, aspects of your life, you see it as a system because it's spatial. 
And when I'm working with businesses now, I teach I basically teach people to manage emotions in the workplace. I set out um, these, you know, like a difficult customer, and uh, the group would name it. Uh, you know, say, yeah, we've got a, you know, it's a, it's a man, and he's aged uh, about, you know, fifty-two years old. And so then we create his life on the stage by setting out. I actually, for that, I use little figures to do that in a spatial way. And people, from thinking of him as just an idiot or some, you know, some other worse word that they might use for him, uh, they start seeing his whole life and why he's acting the way he's acting. And this is a way of developing empathy for for your customer. So that's one of the things that I do in the workshop. I also, uh, anything I teach, I try to do it in action. So I also show, I'm very interested in neuroscience and how that understanding the brain functioning affects emotions. And so I recreate the brain on the stage. You know, I get two people up to be the reptilian brain and I give them arts to play and then I get two more people up and that's the mammalian brain with the emotional brain, you know, the amygdala and the hippocampus. And then another three people to be the rational brain. And they interact with each other and they work away and then, you know, something happens. And somebody at a workshop just um, last week said, you know, I knew, I knew all that stuff about the brain, but I never really understood how it worked. And now the fact that we've done it in action, I, I really get it. So it's a, it's a very uh, powerful way. I was just going to say I can relate to the person that commented, like, I know about these things, but didn't really fully understand how they interact. I I know that everyone's different, but as I've read about them, they make great sense, but it's also something I think, boy, you could spend a lot of time really, truly understanding this. It's not a super difficult read, but at the same time, it's not an easy read in terms of uh, walking away from it and feeling, you know, me personally, like I, I get it uh, after reading a couple of books. So I can see that, that would be that type of, demonstration and, and role playing would be would be very helpful. What size of businesses or organizations are your sweet spot, your niche that, or that you're most effective or most comfortable or whatever doing these types of workshops in? Well, most of my business in New Zealand uh, is a lot of it at least is with um, territorial authorities, the city councils and um, and regional councils. They seem to invest a lot in their people. Plus, they do get a lot of abuse from ratepayers, taxpayers, you know, saying uh, building inspectors, you know, people that have got to go around and, and they have compliance uh, issues. Other, others, I'm, I'm working with a, a large construction company. I just got a workshop um, on uh, Monday when I um, uh, go back to work with um, uh, a huge con- construction company. They they're I just noticed they've got 19,000 employees throughout the world. But I just work with a smaller group, so I work with 12 people at once. Other government departments, I've I've been um, training, what do you call these people, Uh, uh, survey interviewers have got to go around to different houses and interview people as part of their statistics uh, collecting. But also, um, this this works for retail, so I get, I run public workshops um, and get people, you know, I haven't met anybody in, when I've said, this is the work I do, they've said, oh, we need that in our workplace. And I've, I haven't met anybody who hasn't had that response. It's just a question of whether people invest in training their people. And um, uh, business owners you know, need this training. And um, to that effect, I've, I've actually done it. And I've produced an online version of the, of the training um, because some businesses uh, don't care. Now they're spread out. They can't get their people into one room. And I've based my on, online program. I tried to recreate a sense of being in a group, even though it's it's not an actual group. But, but uh, again, I've done it through the stories. And uh, it's proving to be very effective. You know, I was thinking about this. I ha- have a, um, a pretty long history in my careers, <laughs> plural, of being a customer facing person. And whether I start that way or want to be that way or, or, or go into some role wanting to be that way, I get 
found out pretty quick that I can deal with people at various levels within an organization. And so one good example is like I had many gigs where I was, say, on a tech team, uh, maybe anything ranging. Well, help desk is a pretty typical one. So like on a help desk tech team in a large organization. So you have everything from contributors to managers to C staff, uh, the, you know, the um, CEO, CFOs. And um, I would quickly get identified as somebody who is good with dealing with people. And then next they would identify me as someone dealing with the C staffers who are actually in a way they can be the easiest to deal with. They, they have special needs, of course, but <laughs> they can be the easiest to deal with. And then there's the whole external customer thing. So the question I was thinking about, you know, I, I would imagine that teaching an organization to develop empathy for their customers, be they internal or external, is one one thing. But what do you do for those people that are inter- customer facing that are in large organizations where they need organizationally to affect change or, or to be part of change? So in other words, um, take me, I guess, for example, or it could be like a help desk uh, or a complaint center and they're just part of a large organization and yeah, they've got the great skills for dealing with their customers, but maybe there's some processes that need to be changed so that they don't get a constant repeat of what they're dealing with. Does any of your work deal with helping organizations sort of work up the chain, so to speak, so that, you know, it's not just the customer facing folks that are left trying to deal all the time? Yes. Well, I mean, that's a very good point that you make, isn't it? And, uh, the Harvard uh, Business Review published an article several, quite a few years ago called The Customer Service Profit Chain. I don't know if you've ever come across it. And they um, they looked at um, um, a, a number of companies, but one, uh, Sears, I think Sears Roebuck, that was failing. And they looked at, uh, instead of just the, the end, you know, the customer facing people and how they can sell more stuff, they uh, put into place a, the relationship between the manager and the worker at the front was vital to how well the worker in the front did and the manager's manager, the relationship there. And so they really focused a lot on the customer service as in, um, if I'm the manager, then my direct report is my customer. So that's, and it's about my service to that person. Now, and a lot of, so many businesses, that part fails as well as, I mean, they can work out processes for delivery, you know, delivering products and getting things done and taking orders. I mean, that that's one thing. But to me, what I'm interested in is the relationship, if you like, the process. How managers talk to their staff how they manage their own emotions. And um, this work I'm actually going to be doing with this major construction company is with a group of um, managers. And they'll work, they themselves came off the front line, many of them, and they're gruff. And they've got to talk to their, the guys who are operating the machinery. And what they realize in this company is how can these leaders deal with their own emotions and hear what their staff are saying can they really manage the emotions that happen? And particularly in, in the building industry, we have a very high rate of suicide in the building industry here in New Zealand. And uh, partly it's because it's highly male-dominated and men have not been taught how to manage their own emotions. And they've not been taught how to listen to other people's emotions. That's what I've been brought in to do in this company, is to help them... Um, you know, with exactly that moment. And um, the, the senior manager who got me in, he was uh, um, at a, a course at university where I was giving a lecture, and he saw what I did in action, and he just said, he came up to me straight afterwards. He said, ring me on Monday. I have a job for you. This, this is going to work for our people. So internally, yes, people can think about the computer systems or the delivery systems, but what... What really makes a huge difference is the relational system, how managers relate to their staff. And the other way around as well, actually, because a lot of staff won't speak to their managers because they don't know how to manage their own emotions in that aspect. 
maybe there is, you know, you, you're not allowed to talk to anybody in the C-suite because they're, they're far too important. But uh, if people learn how to do that and, and realize that their manager is a person and um, has emotions and, and is struggling with things, you know, people just realize that. Then they can easily go to their, their manager and, um, and just acknowledge that for them. Yeah, I love that you... I guess the answer tells me that yes, absolutely, you deal with these internal issues and that you you said something that really resonated for me is that you know the manager to direct reports relationship is a customer relationship. I had the great pleasure of joining an organization during the end of the dot-com rage that internally did not have, there, there was a part of it anyway, the part that I was in did not have that philosophy and there i guess for lack of better words there was more of like a combative relationship or a controlling relationship between the support people and the internal customer they didn't view them as customers and the pleasure of it was is that i came in and it was i was confused and so i i started showing or really just behaving in a more of a customer relationship sort of way internally and it spread among most of my coworkers and and it Turned the intern that group around, um, and I don't want to take all credit for it. It's, um, fortunately, there were the right people around me that that adopted it. Some of them very quickly, some of them much later, and sometimes it takes new people to come in who just start fresh. And you know, there's a couple that just never can adopt it. But I say it was a great joy because it was a neat experience to witness and be part of that. What a difference it makes because I hadn't been in an organization like that before. Everyone I was in was kind of looked at internal people, whether they said it or not, kind of like customers. And, you know, if we're supporting people internally, we we have to treat them, you know, just like they were a paying customer in the way they are, right? <laughs> yes, that's right. I, I mean, I had a wonderful example of that. I, I also have set up an academy in Bangladesh, of all places, teaching soft skills. And we go there and we work with a lot of uh, bank executives, and they've got 90 private banks over there. It's huge. So we've, we've um, been training these people. They come each, uh, you know, uh, several months in a row, just on a Saturday. And I asked them, this group once, what, what have you been getting out? Of, what difference is this training making? And uh, this uh, man said, you know, I've got 40 staff that report to me, and I'm, I'm very important. And I walk in in the morning. And uh, everybody's got to say good morning to me, and I hardly acknowledge them. And this is the way I was brought up, and this is the, was the culture. But last month, what I learned from this course was friendliness. <laughs> and I was sort of thinking, sitting there going, well, this is amazing, because in New Zealand, you know, part of our way of being is we're all friendly with one another, more or less. So he said, yes, friendliness. And um, I, so I tried this out, and so I've been going in every morning, and I've been saying good morning to people first. And he said, in the month, the whole culture of our uh, business unit has changed, and everybody's talking to each other, and I notice that they're talking to the customers in a new way, in a much more friendly way. And it was such a concrete and specific example of how just changing the way you relate to people in within your business makes a huge difference. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Oh, look, that story, I just loved it when he when he said that, that we really, and that we're making a difference, you know, that this training that I do makes a difference to people in the simplest way, but it can go right out. And, and those 40 staff would be having a good time at work and going out, going back home and treating their families better because they're not so stressed from work. I wanted to ask you too, when you're, because it seems like a perfect place for you to experience this and maybe you, it's something you're able to help companies with or, or combat or whatever. So I was listening to a fascinating conversation on one of my favorite podcasts, a gentleman named Safi Bacall, who I'd never heard of, but uh, probably should have. Um, he's an author and uh, I guess I should mention his books I'm looking at. He's an author of a book called Loon Shots. How to Nurture the Crazy Ideas that Win Wars, Cure Diseases, and Transform Industries. But the overall conversation, because of the nature of the podcast, was all over the place. But they had this thread where the guest was talking about incentives within an organization and how they drive behavior sometimes to the 
often to the peril of a company and, and he even take took it to what many i guess many of us would see as kind of an extreme in that you know companies hire ctos even cmos i say even cmos but they don't hire a chief incentives officer the reason he thought having someone like that was so important is because a manager doesn't really have the time to dive deep into incentives that won't drive behavior that's contradictory to long-term meaningful growth and relationships with their customers, if that makes any sense. And I'm just curious to know if you have seen this, do you do any kind of work in this area? I don't have specifically worked with incentives. Um, I have worked with some companies where a few years ago where we were certainly looking at incentives. But you know, what I do know is that internal rewards are much more stronger for motivating people than external rewards. Can you differentiate the two for me? Sure. An external reward, if you do this, I'll give you $10 extra pay this week per hour or whatever. So giving you something, you know, I'm I'm the one or you get this from outside of you. Or um, if you sell, if you if you reach your targets this month, you'll get tickets to go to um, uh, the movies, you know, or a special show. So the, the company gives out these things for achieving things. Internal rewards are much more psychological. And you do things. This, um, you get an internal reward from a hobby that you do. I don't know what your hobby might be, but... Um, if I um, was learning the guitar and start playing and playing music for myself and I just love playing it, that's a reward in itself. They did this actually with kids, teaching kids to read. They, if you if you sit down and read this book, I'll give you uh, three, you know, a couple of dollars and, and, you know, for every book that you read, you get two dollars. When they stopped giving the rewards, the kids stopped reading. When they started saying, look, just read these, read these books, they're just so much fun. And then kids realize that they read the books because reading books actually is really, is really good fun. It's got an own internal reward. That's an internal reward. And that's what I'm very strong on about creating good relationships in the workplace. They have their own internal reward and that people want to be involved in the business because it's, um, there's good purpose to the business. The vision is clear. Um, this uh, suits my idea of my life you know I'm, I really fit here and so it doesn't matter that I don't get extra pay I can do extra things because it has its own internal reward I feel good about it yeah I can see that I want to ask you now about your business not so much about what you do what you do and who you're serving but sort of the evolution of your business I was reading that you started your current business or at least Maybe the current focus, I'm not sure if the business officially started then, but the current focus that you're on in, in 1998. So you've been going at it for a while. And I was imagining that there's been an evolution. You're doing, well, you talked about creating online workshops to sort of meet the uh, distributed team models uh, where people aren't in one place. Tell me a little bit about the motivation that got you started on the this path. Is Yeah. What, what motivated you to to start the business? Yes. Well, I, I was working in this uh, drug and alcohol hospital and the government started cutting back funding for it. So then uh, the, they came to me and said, look, we're going to make, we want to make you half-time work here just rather than full-time. This hospital was an hour and a half away from the nearest city. My wife was working there as a research and evaluation. And when they cut me, and then they kind of said, actually, we're going to finish the psychodrama program. That was the opportunity for me to then say, well, I've worked with these um, people in recovery, which is really hard work and not all of them make it. If I can bring these same principles into the corporate world where people are already above the zero line they're, they're, or high, reasonably high functioning, but they still need to learn about emotions and, and you know, things that I can teach. So that got me going. We, we had actually, um, the two of us were working for relatively low wages. And um, we also had a nanny. We had a son with preschool. So um, we were paying her the equivalent of one whole wage. So when he went to school, 
we said, well, I only need to earn about $1,000 a year to maintain our current level. That, that helped me take that risk because it is a big jump when you give up a, a salaried position to go out on your own. So that was part of what motivated or that helped um, make make that transition. Yeah, timing. The timing, yeah, the timing and, and just sort of realising you know, we can keep living at this level, with this income level, which was relatively low at the time. Then I had, you know, lots of ideas. I would do some counselling, I would do supervision, and I'd do this training. I quickly realised that one-on-one counselling wasn't what I like doing. I'm a real, I'm trained as a group worker, and I, I'm an extrovert. I just love more people, not just sitting and talking to only one person all day long. So. One business uh, hired me for a day, said, look, come and do this training with our staff. And uh, uh, this person since become a very good friend of mine. Because at the end of that day, he said, well, that was no good. And I went, oh, dear, that's the end of my career. As a, you know, as a, He said, one day, just doing one day is no good. We need to do a day every month. What about you come back and we we'll book you in for the rest of the year? <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, whoa. And so I was off by then, and uh, um, then we that was we were in um, another city, and then we the following year we moved back uh, back to Wellington where I grew up, and uh, then I really got going, and I, you know I read Michael Gerber's book, and I read lots and lots of books at that stage, just how to understand the business. There was a turning point about uh, five years later. We went for a trip to Europe for about six weeks, uh, maybe seven even. And I came back and I'd lost all of my contacts, you know, like I hadn't kept these people alive. And I thought, I haven't got any work. And I had been part of National Speakers Association. You you know, you've got that in the States um, of professional speakers. And I learned a lot there. And one of the things they kept saying was, you need to get a niche or a niche. And I was looking and seeing and visiting speakers coming through and say, this is my niche, this is what I do well, you know, this is my specialty. And I wished I, I was sitting there thinking, I wish I had one. But when I got back from Europe, I, I remember standing uh, there with the, this uh, my ad- admin assistant, we're having a cup of tea. And all of a sudden, I realized it was right in front of my nose. And that is, I know about emotions. That's what I've been specializing in for the last how many years with my psychodrama training and the work at the hospital, plus what I was already doing. I already had this tough program done, and I just said, that's it. I'm only going to do this one thing. And that was now about 15 or 16 years ago that that moment happened, and I completely rebranded, took the plunge, and that's what I've been doing. And I really want to become the expert in this area. Well, that's fantastic. Um It sounds like you are the expert in this area. And the other thing, since you have been going at it for the amount of time that you have, and, you know, kudos to you for reaching out when you did. So nowadays you're reaching out to probably online publications, but podcasts and maybe other types of broadcasters to get the gospel out there, so to speak. And you're you're doing online courses. You've clearly moved to bringing the brand online during all of that time. And maybe you were an early adopter and you're one of the first people to get a website. I don't know, but have there been, I know there have been, but I guess I want to ask which ones jump out in your mind. What changes have you seen having been doing the business that you're doing for dang 20 years, right? Having doing it for 20 years. I was just asking someone in the music business about this earlier because the music business is notorious for dramatic changes having happened in recent years. Not, not, I mean, you know, recent years being 10 to 20, but what kind of changes have you seen that you have adapted to that have been most useful for you? Well, I think one one is that uh, most businesses now have got leaner and leaner. There is no slack uh, available. So they've got the minimum number of staff that they can operate with, um, you know, the whole inventory and, you know, just-in-time delivery has been has been in time, uh, has been, uh, you know, going for a while. And that's really come through to every every aspect. So people are much, much more stressed um, just because they've got to do more with less. So one of the, the things for me is that they, they don't 
getting time off from work to do training is harder than it ever was because they've got nobody else to replace them. If they're not in, at their desk, there's nobody else to do that work. So there's a huge amount of stress, which you know adds to this uh, the emotional reactions. And, and so this, the consequence of that is not, not only are the workers like that, but their customers are also highly stressed because they are coming to this business from their workplace, which is you know uh, under pressure. So we've got to adapt how we present our courses and um, the training, and that's one of the reasons why I developed the online program, so that people could do it just in little bite-sized bits and not interfere with their day's work. So if anybody can do that course. It's not, you know, it's, I've got it online. You know, there's access to it there. So th- this is a sort of a new way, really, of training, and then being able to do this in, um, with an online thing. Well, I did develop that, you know, seven or eight years ago, and not very many people used it back then because it, I was an early adopter of that kind of training. Now people are getting very interested in it and saying, how can we use it? How can it help us uh, with our training? Also being able to use new technology like uh, Zoom and and these, so you can have uh, webinars and seminars online. That's that's, uh, also, um, so it's adjusting to those things. And quite frankly, I love learning these things. I'm having such a ball. I'm, I'm a lifetime learner, no question about it. I'm a daily learner. I learn something new all the time. And I, I just love getting my head around this technology. That is a bit of a blessing for you, isn't it? Because there's a lot going on, a lot to learn. Yeah. Well, John, where is the best place? I think I'm staring right at it, but you've got it. You're online on a couple of places and you've got some different offerings and, and some of them free resources available. Where's the best place for people to find out about everything that you're doing? Well, my website would be the, uh, the best place and that's www.tuff, that's T-U-F, thriving under fire, tuff, T-U-F dot co dot N-Z. I've also got an ebook there that um, your listeners might want to, um, it's a, as a gift, uh, is how to make an effective apology. So it sort of incorporates a lot of um, what we've been doing. You know, so building relationships, you need to make good apologies. And they can get that at www.tough.co.nz forward slash partner. So that'll just be for your listeners. We, we'll just put forward slash partner on that and um, I, I write a, a blog every week it's just very short 250 to 300 words with a little tips on managing this my book is on Amazon so if people want to get that as a Kindle or as a paperback they can get that from Kindle and I'd just like to hear from anybody you know you can um, on my website you can contact me send me an email through LinkedIn page we've got that thriving under fire NZ it's the Facebook page so there's a lot of ways. Uh, I just keep publishing things. and want to give away as much of this information as I can because, you know, ultimately it leads to world peace without being too grandiose about it. Yeah. If we can get peace, peace but in the house, peace in the home, you know, people really communicating, peace in, in business, uh, communicating well there and managing these sort of differences, you know, it's emotional moments. That's the bit that really is going to make a difference business and to life that's great and our connection was doing something a little weird i will put it in the show notes for people who uh, are maybe driving and listening or something or working out and listening but and but want to find that ebook but in case it didn't come through it's tuf.co.nz forward slash partner just the website that that john gave out with uh forward slash partner there and it looks like your website is wisely set up to go with or without www <laughs> so that's yeah, helpful that's too one. yeah john thank you for spending time with me today i really really appreciate it it was a pleasure and i will be for sure talking with you again soon well it's been lovely talking with you too roberto and uh uh looks good there in panama here we're in the middle of winter but it's a sh- the sun is shining, so that's all good. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Always a good thing. Love the sunshine. All right, John, we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Uh, okay, Roberto. Bye-bye. 
Thanks again for listening. If you like what you heard today, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Until next time.